podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gala webinar series. My name is Manuela Noske, and I'm the communications manager here at Gala. Gala is a global nonprofit trade association that serves an international community of organizations and individuals to enable communication and business across languages and cultures. We are headquartered in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. And today, we're going to have a presentation about um, chatbots uh, by Karen Shippey. Um, I will hand it over to Karen in just a moment, but before I do, I need to go over a few housekeeping items. Everyone's lines are muted to cut down on any noise. If you experience any technical difficulties, let me know by using your chat box and I will work with you to troubleshoot them. If you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, you can use the number listed on the GoToWebinar panel to call in using your own phone. We are making a recording of this presentation and you will find it following the presentation on GALA's global website. All participants will receive a link. If you have any questions or comments, please type them into your chat box. We will get to as many questions as we can with the time remaining after the presentation. Next, let me introduce Karen. Karen Shippey is a lead UX content strategist and writer at Nordstrom. She has held various enterprise applications design and development roles at Oracle, Microsoft, and PeopleSoft. Karen is a champion of language design that promotes modern, flexible, intuitive, and understandable user experiences. She writes copy for enterprise and consumer apps and writes visual and language design patterns that drive pattern alignment among application architecture, design, software code, UI, and content. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome you today, Karen, and the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and thank you all for joining me. I appreciate your time and your interest in all things language experiences for chatbots. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. As Manuela, as Manuela mentioned, I am a lead UX content strategist and writer at Nordstrom, where I focus on language design for mostly enterprise tools and sometimes customer apps. And my goal is to truly drive alignment among the design, the code, and the UI to really enable a modern experience that's really understandable in any language. So I want to start off by talking about what sort of intelligent conversational chatbots are. In today's world, they're really the new interfaces for apps, and they are truly changing the way that businesses and customers interact. The power of these really lies in their agency to really perform tasks on behalf of other users and to really, if you will, disrupt existing processes. And these, these opportunities really provide no-brainer conveniences in conducting many transactions, particularly for those on the go. And that really does drive participation in using cloud apps, for example. And the reason that that is such a good thing is that the thinness of a conversational UX and its convenience really suits the enterprise space because users are often experiencing app fatigue and switching between special apps um, and for relatively minor pieces of functionality to get things done in their day-to-day -day work. And with the idea of conversational UIs, no new application is needed. These typically offer really different modes of interaction, for example, like text or voice input, which also allows for multi-generational use. And that really means that there's a wide range of workforce users in varying context of use cases that can be easily designed for. For example, while some users may prefer typing text in, in instant messaging or social media, millennials or other groups may prefer using their voice or even an SMS. And on the business side, these, these chatbots really lower the barrier to entry for app developers because they can easily create interfaces for users to really maximize the use of the app data that we have in the cloud. They're not 
having to create brand new mobile app UIs or really learn the details of underlying infrastructures and technologies, for example, like you know, neural networks or natural language processing or even AIs. So I want to move into sort of what is a conversational UI. It's an interactive dialogue between the user and a computer system that really allows each to talk to the other and in, in that they're you we're using a natural contextual way and we're really assisting a user with a question or a request and how it works at a really high level is a user communicates with the system by typing or speaking their intent and then they read or listen to the system prompts those are the things that we design for and we add more and more utterance to sort of create that effective back and forth conversation and that sort of understanding to enable the user uh, to complete a task or for the system to answer a question. And I'm often asked like what's a good experience or a candidate for a conversation and I first want to focus on what the user's experience is influenced by. It's truly to things. The conversational experience itself, how good is it and does it allow me to get my question answered really quickly or my task accomplished quickly? And the expectations that they have about the conversational experience. Was the tone right for me? Would it have, would it have been much easier or quicker to move into the large application to you know update my phone number in an HR system. But truly the language design goal when we're thinking about designing conversations is to take users intents and help shape the conversational experience in a way that's beneficial to the user no matter what language they're speaking. And when we think about what might make a good conversational experience these you can think of as like the most frequently completed tasks and we'll talk more about that a little later but a couple of examples might be we know that about 80 percent of service calls are simple password or pin change requests so that could be a good example or maybe an employee might need to submit expenses to meet a quarterly deadline or you know a sales rep might need to augment the details for a sales opportunity as they you know walk to the train or a car or the bus um, and other ideas uh, sort of simple approaches might be to take faqs we know that those are constantly reviewed by people which is why they exist so those are often good examples and make good use cases for conversations that fit well into uh, chatbot experiences. I want to move into the types of conversations, like what we actually design for. We really have identified two types of engagements, and within that there are sort of four buckets. So at a very high level, um, we really look for complete start to end tasks with you know immediate results or subtasks that are part of a wider process that can really be modified at another time or on another device and anything that's really mobile and these fall into these you know very large types of engagements one is task oriented and the other is data driven and predictive which is that conversational piece and moving into the types of conversations we have do conversations uh, and we'll talk about these uh, individually as I move through the slides and we have lookups, simple lookups, sort of go-to and decision making. These are the most common types of conversations that really into that really support users today given the technologies we have. So a do conversation is really a mini transaction that users are completing quickly while on the go. And the writing, we, when we think about the examples around this, it's things like schedule a meeting or play a, the latest you know, technology talk, for example. And a, I, the idea for a solution, if you will, a, a language design experience is really to recognize the user intent quickly and guide the user through options that are available within the flow 
you know, by naming the key objects and the values in really quick, short prompts, something that's sort of easily glanceable. The second is lookup. These are tasks that users need to you know, quickly look up information and immediately see that their intent has been understood. And these might take a while, given that they're lookups, so that's why they need to understand that their intent is being their intent is being worked on. So consider affordances, for example. Examples might be, you know, you want to know what your remaining hiring budget is for a fiscal year, or you might want to know what the stock price is today. And the solution from a language design perspective is really to acknowledge the user intent quickly, let the users know that their request is in process and that you're retrieving info, and you want to always use short prompts and affordances in these. Uh, and display data in a way that makes sense for the user's device. You know, for example, show data in the conversation or use voice to communicate to the user. And you also want to communicate in friendly ways, alternatives that help the user retrieve or access data. So if it's a lot of data, you wouldn't want to display it on a small screen device. Instead, you might want to point the user to a place that they can that they can go to, which moves us into the next type and that's sort of the go-to and this is a user sort of working in one context who may need to shift or navigate to another context to see information that they need and this examples of this are you know opening a reminders list or going to performance objectives for this quarter and doing something very quickly like documenting something and then moving back into the context that they were originally in. In this context, you really want to, from a solution perspective, acknowledge the user's need to really navigate to another location and really provide an affordance that suits the user's device to allow them to quickly get in and out of that new location. And in that context of the chat experience, allowing the users to perform simple tra transactions and really confirm any changes or actions. So if they are adding a reminder, allow them to add the reminder, validate that the reminder has been added, and then just move them back into the originating context. And the last bucket is a decision-making one. And these are really what I like to think of as the what-if scenarios. You're looking at confirming possibilities or sort of predicting outcomes. And these are analytics driven in many cases, and they make for really compelling, quick and glanceable solutions. So you wouldn't want anything too um, detailed on a small device. So for example, you know, you might want to know when the best quarter is to contact a prospect, or you want, might just want to know which journal is going to close in a given period. In these cases, the design solution is to really think about acknowledging the user intent quickly and to let them know the system is processing their scenario. Often these what if scenarios will take time to collect data and then to re represent it in a way that works. Um, you want to present the result always in a straightforward way. Again, showing key alternatives if the data is too much for the device size. Support the results always in these, if you can, with quick glance visuals, and then allow users, again, to take action on alternatives. And if they're, if they're actually doing something, that you want them to confirm their choices and actions. And at this point, um, I would like to just move into sort of showcasing an example of a type of conversation. Like, this is an example I'll click through of a type of a conversation that really covers all four of those buckets and does it really well. So this is somebody, a user who's uh, purchasing tickets to a basketball game. And you can see here that the user is asked what their price point is for seats and these are all in US dollars. And then they're asked and you can see that they have an opportunity to choose their seating and you can see a scroll right affordance so that they can see the seating map as well. So they can expand the map, choose the section that they want to be seated in. And they are then asked to confirm or change the tickets and or seat choices. And as an opportunity, the system is suggesting because they have data that tells this that tells the system they know that this person might on occasion 
have wine when they go to a basketball game and this is really sort of bringing that promotion to you in context and this is a promotion asking if the user might want to order wine and if the, the user does in this case and in this context there's a validation of that order of wine and then a validation of the purchase of the tickets and the wine and i think this is a this is sort of a nice uh experience that showcases how all of these sort of buckets can work together and sort of, uh, complement one another in context of a conversation. And at the very end, this allows, this system allows the user to generate uh, their ticket using like a QR code or whatever the, or email it to, or email it to a, an address of their choice. I want to move into talking about the considerations, like what we actually think about when we're designing the conversation. When we think about designing, we want to really think about holistically, you know, business process. What's the need? What's the task? And simplicity of intent. And why this is important is there are some amazing technology out there and platforms that support chatbots, but they are not as robust as they will be. So thinking about the simplicity of use and the simplicity of where we are now in context of technologies, as technologies become more robust, we can branch conversations, but thinking about the simplicity of one intent and another intent and, and not encouraging sort of the branching, but instead building out conversations independently that can work together. Like for example, the one, the previous preceding example with ordering the basketball tickets. We we'll always want to consider multi-role users. Someone may be working on behalf of another. That's in many cases that happens in enterprise. Uh, the multi-generational use, uh, being consistent and thinking about that, will always have people from all generations who may be coming to use this. So allowing them to speak in tents or type in tents. And the mobility aspect towards for cloud handoff, always making certain that if you're designing something that is requiring the system to check for data, that it's the data is in the cloud and always and that, that it's easily accessible and the results are always the most recent and up to date. Contextual awareness. This is really important to consider always. You want to keep the user in context of what they're doing and not presume that they might want to do something else. Um, data security, this is um, significant and you always want to consider um, how you're presenting data, what data you're presenting and what flows you're actually considering. Not everything makes for a good flow. You wouldn't want to encourage a task to be completed that it requires someone to display all personal data if they are doing if they're performing a, a due task and they're on the bus or on a train, because you wouldn't want someone to see that data. And always consider international and localization. Uh, this is important. Today we know that most chatbot conversation flows are built in US English and then rebuilt from the start in the target language. And we know that because many of the auto translation tools out there uh, don't quite capture all the nuances of the conversational voice and tone. As they improve, they will be, they, it will be easier to use those, but today there are some challenges with those getting everything right. And the compromises, if you do use auto translation tools and the and something's not quite right, you might risk losing your audience. If users, we know that when users come to use chatbots, if they have a bad experience, it's unlikely that they will come back to the experience anytime soon. And always consider accessibility for people who have different needs, either cognitive or mobility. When we talk about designing for intent, we're really talking about the designing for the it for the task that the user wants to achieve. So we want to think about the we want to research the user intent and think about that user's environment holistically to really think about their intents. Like where do they work? Like not just the physical location, 
the building? Do they work outside? Do they have an office with a closed door? Is it an open office plan? You know, what is it that they do? How do they do what it is that they do? You know, is it using post-it notes or is it always on the phone? I mean, these sorts of things are very important. How do they work with others and how do they communicate with others? These are all things that sort of comprise sort of the holistic thinking around the intents that you might consider designing for. And when we think about designing for prompts, these are these really represent the system responses, sort of how the system interacts with the user to sort of assist in the conversations. And prompts can take the form of voice or text or set of UI widgets like buttons, so selector buttons, maps, those sorts of things. And you want to choose simple flows. Uh, I cannot emphasize this enough. Just choose simple flows that the users are really likely to encounter frequently. And then consider downstream language needs. Um, and I did mention that most chatbots today are developed in English and then localized and are translated. Um, so really, you know, think, think about the language needs or who really needs to access this. A really good example of a chatbot experience that's used in many countries is the United Nations World Food Program, Foodbot. Uh, this is used in 33 different countries and they've done a really nice job. It's very simple and there's an example here on the right. Uh, it's very simple, but it's very effective. And last, I want to talk about uh, an example that is not considered for translation. Imagine Bank is a bank for millennials in Spain. So this is one that there are no considerations that are needed in context of a large multinational audience. So you can play around with this a little, little bit more because you don't have that consideration. So there may be some examples where you are building for a multinational audience and others where you're building for a very specific locale. When we talk about designing for utterances, we really want to think about the platforms that really support the language, the domain, and really you want to focus on ones that learn or are trainable. And I think the most important question, one of the most important questions you need to consider is, are you building a, a design, a language design experience for a chatbot that supports an enterprise or a consumer? Because those are sort of different language types. I've taken a very enterprise approach to this conversation or this presentation rather, because that's, uh, that's where my focus has been. Consumer needs are similar in many instances. And if you're thinking about it from a holistic multinational enterprise perspective, then I think you're kind of on the right path to support consumer considerations as well, because certainly your consumer considerations have some similarities. For example, if I build a chatbot that I expect to only be used here in the United States, um, we will have users who are English language learners uh, who might be using it. So we would have some considerations there too. Some, some platform examples, and these are this is not a comprehensive or exhaustive list. These are some of the ones that I have used just for the purposes of, of learning and for building out chatbot experiences. There are many out there, many good ones. These are just the ones uh, for for purposes of example that I'm sharing with you today. And these also contain a bit of um, documentation that you can learn from about how they work, how they're supported, how their um, translation pieces work. So I would encourage you if you're not already familiar with some of these or others to sort of get out there and take a look at them. When we talk about the conversational flow design considerations. Uh, I have a few sort of top level things that I recommend thinking about. And the first one is, I've, is enabling user discovery. You want to, all, excuse me, um, you want to always identify the user's immediate intent. 
you want to accelerate agency. So get that user going as quickly as you can. You don't want this any task to take longer to do in a chatbot experience than it would if they had to open a large scale app. You want to enable exploration. So while they might come to um, change a phone number, you might also give them an opportunity to change an address. That's still in context of the experience because there might be um, there might be somebody who's changing a phone number because they've moved. And you also want the ability to learn from the con user context and behavior. You want to always establish real world rapport. So you want to recognize the match between the intention and the conversation. You want to think you want to think very much about the image or avatars that you're using, make sure they're friendly. And if you are going to use images, make sure they're culturally appropriate. You want to maintain a personal conversational voice and tone, but don't sound too human. You want to promote a logical way of doing things, recognizing that the user might not approach it in that same way. So don't force users down a specific path, because even if they come to perform the same task multiple times, the chances of them uh, coming back and completing that task in the same exact way each time um, may change. You want to always use familiar formats or artifacts, so don't switch up, you know, a button for something that is not button-like um, because it's a learning curve and it can be really confusing. I'm not certain if any of you uh, are aware of Meekin. It's a scheduling it's a scheduling chatbot and it does a really nice job of sort of bal balancing that conversational voice and tone and being very efficient in context of, of scheduling. And um, so it's a great, ex it's a good experience to look at. We want to use a conversational tone always. So if you're not, if your source language isn't Latin, you want to really not use Latin as placeholder text. Remember that you'll have reviewers and other stakeholders you'll want to run your conversations through um, for consideration or for feedback and it doesn't help them to see uh, Latin text if that's not their language or if that's not the language that this is going to be developed in and you'll find that stakeholders uh, during the review process for flows will um, often um, offer really uh, smart feedback that informs changes and or other ideas for tasks that might users might do in the same context or need to do in the same context. So reflect style, tone, like how we talk, how you have a conversation with your colleagues. Uh, be concise, be consistent, and always remain in context. You want to recognize domain and slang terms, but you never really, you don't want the system to regenerate slang terms, but you want to be able to recognize them. If you're going to use humor, I suggest really take care what one person may find funny, another may not, or it may be lost on people in a translation or localization experience. Be honest when it comes to errors and failures, fail gracefully. So if you can't, if the experience can't support help the user or support the user, let them know that, but send them to a real human to have to assist them because you don't want that user to not have been able to complete the task, even if it means them having to call a customer service line. And remember, you want to take care and not use all caps. That's using all caps often is a reflection of shouting. We don't tend to do that. We wouldn't want to do that in this context either. Always address simple intent. A good way to do this is sort of the jobs to be done, take model. The 10% of the tasks that 90% of the users do 90% of the time. So those really simple, quick in and out tasks or questions that you know you get asked a lot. That's where the FAQs come in. Keep it simple. Simple tasks like do, go, can I. Engage. In, Write engaging conversations. You think about how you might improve or disrupt a business process that's really cumbersome and that you've heard many times could be simplified and you actually have ideas for how to simplify it. Always require a minimum typing or speaking experience. Give the user control in all cases. Sort of let, them, let the user know when the chatbot's thinking. You know, use ellipses. 
and always allow for a second bite. Users might think that they need to edit or correct something. Sure, you allow them to correct the typo. They don't need to. The systems are smart enough or growing smart enough to recognize typos, but allow them to do that. Allow them to input information in any order. Um, and then always allow them to move to a human resource if, they, if, if the system can't assist them. I mentioned grace, great, failing gracefully, always have an alternative. And provide an easy way to submit extra information. You might not think the user should add information, additional information like a Word document, but the user may think so. So allow them to do that if they think that they need that. Guide the conversation with pathfinding options, buttons, recommendations. Always, always, always disambiguate before performing any kind of commit action. Make sure that the user really wants to change the number to the phone number that they've provided. They could have made a mistake in typing it. This is the last opportunity for them to confirm that the change is indeed what they expect it to be because you don't want them to have to go back through the experience. Support wherever you can with really quick, glanceable visuals. Always offer in-context conversation assistance, um, particularly for anything that you find is complex. And you want to use platforms that really support uh, learning because you want the system to help shape conversations and responses with that user going forward. Think about the cloud. The cloud allows us great flexibility. So, you know, design for that and, you know, provide for persistence across interruptions and multimodal use. So, for example, I could be a salesperson who's started a doc to document something and update, a, for example, a, a prospect record on my mobile device, my handheld device like a phone. And then I'm on the train and I pull out my laptop and I would want to be able to continue that experience. So allow for that. Think about how that works or how users actually work. Again, think about the holistic environment of that user, how they work, where they work. And always when you are considering these design considerations, think about the device preferences. Don't force users to change their preferences. That's Most users find that a frustrating, a frustrating experience. For every language design question, ask yourself how useful is the result? Because you could build a really phenomenal experience, but it might not solve any real challenge. It not, might, might not be one of those 10% tasks. So ask yourself how useful is the result? Because at the end of the day, useful results are the ones that people want. Um, this is an example that I share which I don't think will run in this context of a chat bot that I built that really walks th users through, uh, through signing up for what we, uh, retirement account that we have here in the US. And it's not something that's translatable because it uh, persists only here in the US. But it's really quick. It allows the users to move through a process that's super cumbersome and really hard to understand very quickly and efficiently. But you'll notice that I identify myself as not being a financial advisor. I've communicated very clearly that I'm a chat bot and I am helping them move through this experience as quickly as I possibly can. So the practices for writing conversations, I think in context of the of the content strategy aspect, I highly recommend designing reusable templates, whatever that template looks like. This is a simple example of a template that I like to use that really is more of a job to be done approach. Um, and this is super simple. You the way that I do this is I fill out a template where I add a brief explanation of the situation or the problem that I'm trying to resolve and identify the user by the job title or role and then list the specific user wants or needs and then list the outcomes that I expect. The goal here is to share this with stakeholders to make sure that you're aligned before you build out a really comprehensive experience and then move from that to an experience like this, where you have an actual physical example of a device. 
you will get more feedback from your stakeholders if you allow them the flexibility to see the experience in a device. On the right, you'll see that I have it set the text, the copy set in a table, and this is great and fine. It allows for quick updates to copy, but users want to see things, or excuse me, stakeholders want to see their copy and the experience in context. It'll help them understand the user experience and relate to it much, much more easily. And you'll see that in this, I this is a simple PowerPoint that I built where I have allowed the user, meaning my stakeholders in this case, to move through an experience and they can modify all of the pieces and parts of this. So they can add text bubbles, they can change the icon avatar that I'm using, and they can write different responses. So it has helped tremendously to build out an ex a simplified template. And that way you are sort of communicating the one experience that you are expected to be designing because it takes quite a bit of effort to shape a conversation and to build out each of these and you don't want to leave it so open that you get so much feedback that you can't accommodate. You often find that feedback from stakeholders informs new ideas for new opportunities for conversations. So thinking about best practices when you're thinking about language design from a global perspective, uh, write complete strings and provide scripts. Your engineers or developers will need those. Always create glossaries of terms, include synonyms, slang, abbreviations. Apply standard design review heuristics um, and then usability test before this, before this goes to production. It can be very simplified usability test, but test, test, test. Your users, in addition to your stakeholders, your, will help you build an experience that really works for them even better. Consider multilingual architecture. Design simply so that when the platforms become more elaborate and more robust, you can you don't have to recreate the existing conversations, you can add to them. Always, if you're if you're working with translation vendors, consider ones that have domain and locale UX experience because they will often understand uh, the the experience that you're trying to design and guide through conversation. The, in the context of the localization experience, these are the sort of standard localization considerations. Consider character sets, text processing, you know, reading and writing direction, you know, locale support. These are very important because, as most of us know, what appears in one language may be the the quantity of copy may be extended or enlarged in others, other languages. I'll skip this since I don't think it will run, and I will move to new challenges. Uh, there are a lot of new challenges in industry right now, and some of our some of the conversations that are ongoing in this space are ones around cultural theory and interaction and questions around bot personality. Should the bot have a personality? Should it not? Should bots have gender? Should they have names? These all affect how people engage. What about sentiment or emotion? What about surrounding chit chat? Some people like that, some people don't. Pop references, are they appropriate? What about time sensitive tasks? For example, if a natural disaster occurred and you're and your company is encouraging people to donate because they're going to match the donations. You know, maybe that's a time boxed experience that you build out. And emojis as a language, which ones do you use and in which order? And be careful thinking through these. You know, we have a concept of this of donuts here in the US, and they're these round, fluffy, delectable, sweet treats. But those aren't the same in all countries. And in some countries, they look completely different. So using a donut emoji might not make sense in all places where the content will be read or used. And I want to leave you with one last question, and that is really whether uh, you whether you think that AI is the ultimate UX challenge. 
And with that, I say thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Karen, for that really interesting um, overview. Um, folks are typing in their questions right now, but I'm, you know, very interested here in the in the global perspective on chat box and so let's start with this one here you mentioned uh, that there are, i think four basic user scenarios i think they do go to decision making and look up um, is that globally true or have you noticed that in other cultures there's more people want to do with their chatbots or less that's a great question thanks for that question um there are in the enterprise space those are the top tasks that we've identified and that actually um, I, we have actually tested in other countries um, in context of large scale enterprise applications. But certainly there will be differences among um, user bases and in context of the apps that you might be considering using uh, chatbots with. So I would urge you to think through what those top groupings, those buckets, if you will, are for your user base and for the apps that you're designing. So certainly they scale, but they're not all, they're not the only buckets. Those are just the most popular ones based on the experiences that I have yeah. had in my work. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, and we have one question around, uh, you called them auto translation tools. So one of our participants is asking or saying that uh, he's found uh, existing cat tools, uh, including XLIF, don't work uh, for translating chatbots, which is what you mentioned, as there are typically several variations or utterances or replies that may translate to different number of variations in the other language. Um, a translator should always translate the intent and not the literal text. In your experience, are you, what CAT tools do you think are out there that are actually suitable for translation, for translating chatbots? Huh. That's a fantastic question. And that's when I spoke about considerations for translations, I think that is one of the biggest challenges out there today, um, using tools that automatically will handle those translations because they they are they sometimes do miss the mark. I I actually have an example which I'm not certain if I will run in this context, but this is an example I actually built out for a, a Seattle localization user group. And I built this out in US English first, and then I used a translation engine and ran this through, the whole copy through it, and realized that it didn't quite capture the nuances of the conversation, including the utterances, so I retranslated it from scratch into Italian. And I feel like uh, there are, I, I, I don't want to name tools because I don't want to suggest preferences, but there are certainly, there's no substitute today for moving through this rebuilding experience. That's typically what happens. It's written in a source language and rewritten in the um, target language from the start to finish because so, of that exact challenge. Yeah, so human translator is still needed human. nowadays. In, nowadays, yes, I would say. Is this, in your experience, is this getting addressed? I in my in my experience it is it's one of the new challenges mm -hmm. i think uh, companies are aware of this and as the platforms grow and the support that and the support grows within these platforms and people start using these more and more these tools that support this work will become smarter if you will and it will move to a point at some point where it is a more efficient practice but i don't know that it will ever replace the human translator experience or the person who's doing localization because mm -hmm. i think it's just so hard to get the nuances right and the utterances yeah 
Um, and following up on this, we have it's a two part question, and that is, you know, which, which languages in your experience perform best uh, with with bots? So are there any that are, are just simply doing better, maybe in, in terms of succinctness and shortness and grammar? Uh, and then which cultures are the most at ease with chatbots? And we can also rephrase that to like in what markets are actually our chatbots used the most widely? Those are great questions. Okay, so I'll start with the second part first. Where what I do know in context of the enterprise space, uh, the U.S. or North American market uses them. Uh, we do know that they're used in EMEA. Um, they're also used in South America. We and I do know that they're used in parts of Asia. Uh, certainly, like I know that um, I have worked with a group in Japan who's thinking about using them um, or who has been using them. And so I definitely think it varies by regions and locale, um, but I do think it's, this is something that many larger companies are looking at and trying to determine how best to incorporate these experiences that enable the user. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and following right up on that, I mean, is there reason to believe that in, in markets where uh, character input is a challenge may move to chatbots more quickly? Yes, I do think like that World Food Program Foodbot is a really good example. Um, those Those are simple. And what I really like about it is those are the that is widely used. It's used in 33 countries to collect data that really enable the program support for getting food to food and or supplies or what's needed to these um, mm -hmm. areas that are that are defined as in need. And I definitely think that they will be enablers more and more as we we become more and more the information on the go workers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one other user here um, is curious about your process for designing and validating a bot persona, in particular when you test your bots, what kind of feedback do you actually are trying to get from your stakeholders and users? That's a fantastic question. Yes, you should start with a persona um, and think about that persona from the context of the user holistically. Um, I definitely think that the idea of looking at it from the 10% of tasks that 90% of the users do 90% of the time help. When you are targeting usability participants for these tests, really target people who fit into that persona or who would likely fit into that persona. I definitely think that they will help inform changes, um, but you probably have personas today that you build larger scale tasks around. So if you're working on just creating a conversational UI for a subtask, you can maybe start with the persona that you have in place today. And then when you test you'll see like sort of what the deltas are and what the what what hasn't been addressed in your current existing personas i don't i i do modify existing personas i have written specific personas but that's just for the matter of sort of testing out unique chatbot experiences but i found that some of the personas that we use today do scale well for the bot experience. You want to know whether it's understandable when the user is reviewing it and if it's some task or question that can be quickly addressed. And when I say quickly, like much more simply and much more efficiently than if the user had to go into the large scale app. So a simple task like updating a phone number or adding a beneficiary or adding an expense report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure this is, um, you, you can't answer this question, but what are best practices for detecting a user's language in a chatbot? I can't answer that. That's more of a platform question. I do think that there may be some platforms out there that can support language detection, um, but I can't answer that for certain. And I would I would offer that you would want to investigate that in context of the platform. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Um, and then finally, can you actually automatically test a bot? How, how do you go about that? Or is this all manual testing that needs to get done? Well, you can certainly build chatbots. I'll tell you a quick example. I've built, I have built chatbots, like for example, the Seattle Localization User Group chatbot. I built that in Dialogflow, which is um, simple and straightforward. And then I ran it in Slack and I also ran it in uh, Facebook on the other platforms. So you can certainly have a user have a user tested in that environment as well before you move to a larger scale platform where it's being designed or built into an existing app, say an HR app or a larger scale suite of applications. Mm -hmm. And finally, you had, uh, you know, one of your most interesting slides, at least for me, because I'm very interested in cultural issues, is the one around, you know, gender and humor and the persona of the bot. Um, any indication that it is helpful to have different personas for different cultures? Or are we better off to truly globally design a chatbot that is neutral, doesn't have gender, seems to be middle-aged, you know, to sort of... Um, you know, satisfy everybody's needs and desires? I think generally that would be best approach to design it for the global experience. But do, like if you are designing like the Imagine Bank for a very specific audience and it will not be used multinationally, then you can be a bit, more, you could take a bit more risk and design it being a very much more specific to a, a persona that's very specific to that country, region, locale, or protectorate. Um, but I think the same rules apply with chatbot persona and designs as do with the larger scale design experience holistically from visual to uh, copy experiences with large UI or uh, for large scale applications like an HR application or a supply chain application. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Karen. That is all the questions that we have, um, but this, this has been really interesting and, and a f fascinating discussion. So thank you for taking the time um, to, to educate us on this topic. Um, and thank you to all of our audience members uh, for joining us today. Uh, we would really appreciate it if you could take just a, a minute to give us your feedback on today's session using the post event survey. So it will pop up when we're done here. It is short, um, but your perspectives help us to continue to refine our webinar program. And, and so we'd, we're happy to take specific inputs and requests as well. We just kind of need to understand what direction you would like us to move into. And with that, Karen, I know you're in Seattle, so I wish you a very good day. Um, and to many of our other um, audience members, I wish you a good night. Uh, and I hope uh, I will see you again in another gala webinar soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.